All right. Yeah. Welcome back, everyone. Is the mic on? So glad you could make it on a Saturday, despite the nasty New York weather. I'm sure more people are going to be trickling in. We had a wonderful first day yesterday. Uh, someone said this event is the Coachella of tech policy. <laughs> We're going to officially change the name next year to that. Um, uh, but uh, I think the second day is going to be awesome. We have two panels today. And after that, uh, many of the speakers are going to be sticking around for lunch, and I hope all of you will. Uh, and it's a chance to, to mingle and uh, you know, have further discussions about, uh, uh, about these topics. Uh, so the moderator for the first panel today is Moor Naman. He's a uh, professor of information science at Cornell Tech, and his lab focuses on the trustworthiness of the information ecosystem. So he has really deep, deep expertise in the, uh, the areas of, uh, of this event, and we're really glad that he was able to uh, make time to be a moderator for the panel today. Uh, and he's won many, many awards. I won't go through his full bio. You can see it on the conference website. Um, yeah, I'll take it away more. All right, good morning. Uh, thank you all for coming this morning. Clearly we have uh, here the attendees that are not only the hardiest, but also the most diligent. Uh, of course, also the smartest and the most attractive. And for those online, I can only assume the most European. Um, in any case, uh, you guys are the best. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm going to keep it uh, short. We have, uh, I think I've seen a lot of uh, uh, great uh, talks and discussion. Uh, we have I think surprisingly little in terms of understanding the experience of actual people in this algorithmic amplification environment. Uh, this panel is not going to entirely uh, close the gap, but at least we're going to have uh, some uh, hints at it. Uh, but instead, I think this panel, panel can provide uh, most significantly ammunition and ideas for the reform uh, panel that we have uh, next, including some data of what uh, needs uh, fixing, uh, as well as some ideas of what might uh, work and might not work. Uh, so with that, to give us these ideas, we have a great uh, set of speakers that are, uh, I, I'm going to call them the next generation of uh, uh, academic thinking on this topic. Uh, first up, I have the bio here, uh, we have uh, Jason Burton, who is an assistant professor of, at the Copenhagen Business School and an, uh, and, and Alexander Van Humboldt Research Fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development. His research uses computational methods to study human behavior in the context of the digital society. Jason, all yours. Okay. Not quite as tall. Um, so, good morning, everybody. As uh, Moore and Arvin said, this is clearly the hardcore crew, 9.30 in the rain. Thanks for being here. Um, my name is Jason Burton. I'm a psychologist who studies how new technologies impact people's ability to reason with information, make good decisions, and generally form accurate beliefs about the world. And while I think many of us often find ourselves feeling pessimistic or cynical about the role of algorithms and social media in society, today I'd like to argue for a slightly more positive view. Um, my vision of social media and the internet at large is uh, one in which the algorithmic curation of content online is not viewed as a danger to be mitigated, but as an opportunity. In my vision, the internet provides an online public sphere where people go to deliberate, to be informed, and to develop some kind of collective intelligence. And right now, that sounds kind of utopian. Uh, but it wasn't so long ago that social media was labeled a liberation technology that was going to usher in the era of the more informed, more engaged citizen. And in some ways, that is in fact what it's doing. Um, so here we see the results of a recent meta-analysis that covers over or, or roughly 500 academic studies on the effects of digital media use on democracy. And what's clear is that studies overwhelmingly find that digital media use associates with increased civic participation. You know, intuitively, these technologies allow people to get involved in political discussions and to engage with each other, which is a good thing for democracy. But the effects on people's actual knowledge are much more mixed, and at the same time, digital media use is also generally associated 
uh, with increased exposure to misinformation and increasing polarization, which often has been catching the news headlines. Um, so why is this the case? Why has social media and the internet provided an online public sphere that seems so ill-suited to truly informed deliberation and collective intelligence? Um, there's obviously no one single answer to this, uh, but a main hypothesis centers on the theme of this symposium, algorithmic amplification. And in particular, the observation that algorithms curating content online are promoting content to users for the hope of maximizing engagement, right? And the worry is that the content that is most engaging is not necessarily the content that is informative. So what can we do about it? How can we move towards an online public sphere that caters to and elicits collective intelligence? There are many proposed ways to improve things. I, of course, skew towards the psychology literature, uh, but proposals there include fact-checking and labeling misleading content, nudging people to be more self-reflective before spreading information, boosting people's digital competencies, and introducing regulation to help people take control of their personal data. All of those things seem meaningful and worthwhile, but all operate on the front end, so to speak. And mostly, I'd argue, put the burden on the user while leaving the fundamental structure of online environments unchanged. Another way to approach it, though, might be to redesign the back end. So in other words, to redesign the algorithms that underlie uh, the online platforms we go to for information. The important point here is that I'm not arguing or suggesting that we get rid of content curating algorithms. Without them, we'd be faced with a paralyzing overload of information that would be impossible to navigate. Instead, what I'm suggesting is that we design those algorithms to optimize for something other than engagement. And this is what I'm looking at in some ongoing research. But in particular, um, what I'm interested in is uh, collective accuracy in judgment, decision making, or forecasting. So what I want to develop are um, algorithms that will promote content to users such that after some time on the platform, the aggregated judgment of the users becomes more accurate with respect to some objective ground truth. So for example, you can imagine people debating online over whether a surge in cases of some novel disease will overwhelm health services without the introduction of some lockdown measures. And such a scenario would be desirable for those people to form an accurate collective belief or an accurate collective prediction so that if, for example, public opinion were to be surveyed, the correct course of action would be supported. So it's with that kind of scenario in mind that I set up my research objective here to design, deploy, and evaluate algorithms that mediate online deliberation to elicit accurate collective judgments and forecasts. And importantly, these algorithms should work without access to ground truth knowledge, which we often don't have in the most pressing real world scenarios. So ultimately the view is for such algorithms to be integrated into existing recommender systems, but also they could be used to power entirely new purpose-built civic technologies. Now, how am I gonna do this? How am I gonna set out on this research objective? Well, the overarching approach is to take the logic of recommender systems that optimize for engagement, but instead try to optimize for collective intelligence. So first, we'll need to develop low-level metrics that quantify whether some content is likely to elicit a belief update from users that would benefit collective accuracy. And that's really not a straightforward task, right? It's hard to know what content is accurate or informative when we don't know what the ground truth actually is. Um, in the forthcoming paper, I outlined some possibilities for how you might do this, but the general gist is that I'll be drawing from different bodies of literature, like research on wisdom of the crowd effects, which includes methods for spotting accurate individuals in a crowd of forecasters. And I'll also look at research on argumentation theory, which includes methods for evaluating the strength and structure of arguments. And then from there, the natural next step to evaluate whether those metrics are at all useful, in my eyes, is to run some experiments. Now, these experiments can take their shape in a variety of forms, as we've seen throughout this symposium. They could be simplistic lab-style tasks, to multiplayer online games, to full-fledged uh, field experiments on existing platforms. But given the exploratory nature of this work, we're going to start simple. And so this is a schematic of an experiment I'm running with some colleagues at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin. Uh, and the idea here is to essentially study algorithmic amplification in a Petri dish. Right? So we'll have participants indicate their left-right political leaning and then proceed with the basic belief updating task of stating a belief, viewing some content, and then revising their belief. 
But importantly, we're going to manipulate what contents part participants see by using different algorithmic approaches to sample and rank content from a larger inventory of content. So, for example, in one condition, we'll use an engagement-based approach and show participants the posts that previously received the most upvotes and downvotes in our pre-testing of the content. In another condition, we can use our newly developed metrics to show participants posts that we think are likely to increase belief accuracy. And then in our control condition, we're just gonna randomly sample from that inventory. And I know in this symposium, there's been a lot of uh, passionate discussion about neutral baselines, and so I'd be keen to maybe pick that up in a conversation later. Uh, once this is done, we'll look at the accuracy of participants' beliefs to see if, for instance, our new algorithmic ranking scheme led to more accurate judgments as compared to engagement-based ranking and the control group. Okay, but so why, why am I doing all this? Why am I going through the hassle of these sort of gimmicky experiments? What key points am I hoping to convey through this work? Well, firstly, I'd like to argue that to realize the promises of social media and the internet at large, we need algorithms. As Arvind said in one of his posts, algorithms are not the enemy, but we should design them to align with our goals and values. And specifically through experimentation, I hope to show that we can design algorithms to curate content in ways that increase the objective accuracy of our beliefs, which seems intuitively good for society. And finally, a general point I hope to convey is that we should not only be researching how things are, but also how things could be. If we aren't satisfied with the status quo, we need to be able to present empirically sound alternatives. And I hope that through this work, I'm able to point towards one such alternative. And with that, I'd just like to thank many colleagues who helped shape these ideas. Philip, Stefan, Julian, Ulrika, thank you. Uh, thank you to the Humble Foundation for supporting this work uh, financially. Uh, and thank you to Arvind, Katie, and the Knight Institute for the opportunity to present. Thanks. Thank you. This uh, one working? Oh, yes. I think it is. Uh, I'll stay here to introduce our next uh, uh, panelist. Our next speaker is uh, Kevin Feng. Uh, Kevin is a PhD uh, student in the Human Centered Design and Engineering Department at the University of Washington. Uh, his interests are at the intersection of social computing and human centered machine learning. He's motivated by the observation that key stakeholders are increasingly at risk of agency loss from black box by powerful technologies in social technical systems. Uh, Kevin has a background in design as well, right, I think? And uh, I think we'll see some of that in, uh, in his talk today. And I would just recommend uh, all these papers. I think there's a lot of wonderful details in all the papers that are going to be presented today. So I encourage you to uh, go and look at those papers behind the, uh, beyond the 10-minute presentations. Kevin. Great. Uh, good morning, everyone. And unfortunately, the slides are a little bit misformatted. Um, so sorry for the lack of contrast in the title there. That's supposed to be white. I'm not exactly sure what Told happened. You. So um, <laughs> please bear <laughs> with me for that. Uh, uh, yes. OK. So um, thank you more for the introduction. And um, as you mentioned, I'm Kevin. Uh, I'm from the University of Washington. And from my bio, you, might, you may get the sense that I come from a uh, human-computer interaction background. And that is indeed true. A mix of computer science and design. And in Ravi's uh, talk yesterday, something that I uh, really appreciated was him pointing out that design is a, indeed a very promising path going forward in terms of uh, thinking about how platforms might mitigate some harmful aspects of amplification. And I definitely agree that there is indeed this rich design space ahead of us here, which makes uh, me a researcher in HCI really excited about this as someone who is always thinking about the design um, and the building and the evaluation of uh, human-centered systems. Um, and that's very much in the spirit of the work that I'll be talking about today. Um, and before diving in, I'll just say quickly that uh, what I'll present today are the results of early findings and uh, early design sketches. And so I'd love to hear uh, all of your thoughts on this, uh, either in the panel discussion as well as afterwards, too. And let's see if this is working. Oh, okay, this is very poorly formatted, sorry about that. Um, okay, hopefully this can still help me um, you know, get through my presentation and deliver my points. So I'll start by, by talking a little bit about agency in the feed. Um, and so when, so Facebook launched their newsfeed in 2006, but before that, 
I would assume that what most users would do is go around individually to their friends' profiles and check for updates that way. And in that sense, they had uh, a lot of agency. They could choose exactly who to view information from and exactly when to view that information. So when the feed launched, you know, users traded off a little bit of agency for convenience. So they no longer had um, as much control, but like everything was just in the feed, ready for consumption. Um, and so today we're kind of on the other end of the spectrum where engagement feed algorithms act as these social architects for us. So they determine exactly what we should see, um, who to see, uh, from whom uh, we're seeing these uh, types of content, and also when we're seeing these. And understandably, many users feel robbed of agency uh, as a result. And because of this, many users have derived these algorithmic folk theories um, to try and reclaim some of that agency. And uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, folk theories are, are these informal conceptualizations about how these algorithms work. And they're studied quite extensively in HCI literature and beyond. Um, because even though these theories might not align necessarily with the technical realities of a system, there's still, they still play a big part in influencing user behavior on these platforms and as a result, influencing the behaviors of the platforms themselves. Um, and after deriving these, these folk theories, users would start to interact with the feed in these strategic ways. So one example would be watching a video over and over again to indicate to the algorithm that uh, they are indeed, in seeing, indeed interested in seeing similar types of content in the future, even though they might understand the video the first time through. Um, and these strategic interactions can be thought of as teaching or, or you know, training the algorithm, but I specifically like the framing of teaching because teaching is an inherent, an inherent human ability in that we've all experienced it either formally through you know, education systems or informally through giving instructions or receiving instructions or tutorials from others. Um, and so what we might be interested in doing in, in social media systems is trying to shift more power over to users um, by designing feeds that really embrace and welcome these teaching uh, interactions. Currently, teaching is, is more or less seen as a way, to, as a, like a backdoor solution to try and um, counteract uh, undesirable default behaviors of the feed, but what if we can actually embed these into a part of uh, feeds themselves? And so, so the question here then becomes, oops, okay. But before we actually uh, dive in, like the important que question to ask here is, what do users even want to teach, like you know, theoretically, if they were given a learnable agent, teach these uh, agents in the context of social media feeds for curation purposes, and how would they go about doing that? And so to figure out these, these questions, we ran a um, design study, and you can, you know, the full, full methodological details will be available in our full paper when it comes out, um, but I'll just talk about things on a very high level here. Um, we ran an interactive design study with 24 participants across four platforms, where we asked them to share with us 10 pieces of content from their uh, social media feeds, and then uh, curate their ideal feed by re-ranking uh, the content that they provided. And we asked them to provide kind of rationale for the position of each of these posts in their ideal feed through these templates, which we call signals. Um, and here's an example. So the first one is you know, the default template, and the second one is an example that the user uh, filled in during the study. And essentially what these signals try to do is elicit you know, what participants actually find valuable within a post and why they find it valuable. Um, and after the activity, we also conducted a short um, post-activity interview with participants just to get their thoughts on and experiences on social media feeds a little bit more generally. And we came away with many findings, but I'll just highlight, uh, just for the sake of time, a couple um, here. And I'll also talk about some design implications that go with those findings just to see how, how the two, uh, just so that you can see how the two fit together. Um, and so the first one is, is this. So users, many users prioritized people in their social media experiences, but they also noticed this 
content first shift in the way that platforms were recommending content to them. And the most notable example here is that four out of the six participants um, in, who were Instagram users in our sample actually did not see any content from close friends or family or anyone else they really cared about uh, with the posts in their study. And I really like this quote here. It, this was from a participant who realized this during the study itself, um, who said that, you know, what a horrible development. How have I only just noticed? And this really points to this frog boiling effect. And I think there's, there's uh, a really interesting design opportunity here, which is allowing users to teach more granular preferences to the platform. So currently on, on you know, Twitter or Facebook today, if you were to go and like a post, what is it that you're actually liking? Is it the author or is it something that they said in the post, the keyword or maybe the general topic or hashtag, et cetera? Um, there's no way to actually you know, explicitly provide these more granular um, preferences. And so here is an interface that we sketched out that uh, might be able to help with this. And we really took inspiration from exploded views in 3D modeling here, where um, this view can, uh, within this view, you can see kind of the individual components of the 3D model. And so we thought if every time you say, go like a, social, uh, like a post on social media, um, and it can explode into these individual components, you can then go through and pick out the components, say like, I, I want to see more of this specific component or less of these specific things, as a more explicit act of, of teaching and uh, providing more granular feedback. And we also found that there is little support for organizing archived content, um, even though archival was something that participants engaged in quite a lot, uh, saving content for later consumption. Um, and so, for example, this, this participant here actually just sends, you know, content to others as a way of managing their archival. Um, and I think there's a really missed opportunity here because archives can be a really good set of examples, or you can think of it as a teaching curriculum, um, when teaching preferences uh, to this algorithmic agent. And so what if we shift uh, to an alternative approach of designing the feed, where instead of just scrolling and allowing the stream of information to flow by, um, what if we redesigned the feed to foster these more intentional um, and goal-oriented interactions through uh, archiving and curating meaningful content? And I think the, a, a fitting metaphor here is a Spotify playlist. So one core interaction on Spotify is for users to go and find music and then save it to individual playlists. So what might a content playlist look like? So we've sketched out an example over here. And although you know, this concept might look quite simple, um, you we can start to imagine kind of the additional interactions that we can build on top of this. Say, for example, attaching uh, user-written goals to specific content playlists or uh, syncing playlists with, um, say, certain calendar uh, invites or calendar events, and just in general steering uh, future recommendations with these playlists. Um, and before I end, I just want to address um, this one elephant in the room here, which is that these large uh, for-profit corporate platforms will still you know, likely be the primary providers of our social media experiences going forward. And they're not really you know, um, motivated to consider these more teaching-based approaches if there are no incentives to do so. So we think that there are actually indeed incentives here. And to illustrate, I'll talk very briefly about uh, ads. And so ads, were, um, ads appeared quite frequently in our user study because a lot of the posts that the participants submitted to us were of ads. And participants mainly disliked ads, um, you know, not surprisingly. But it was mainly due to their irrelevance and low quality rather than just you know, the idea of having ads on the platform itself. Um, and so, so an example here in the first in the kind of first quote there, a non-U.S. citizen kept receiving ads for the U.S. forces, and they were wondering why they got that. Uh, but on the other hand, ads can be genuinely useful. So one of our participants did uh, casual part-time modeling, uh, and actually through a local ad, she landed a a contract at an agency. 
Um, and so overall, bad ads can, can be harmful to both users and platforms. Platforms' reputations might dip, and you know, that's certainly not something they're interested in. And users also don't want to be exposed to, to these types of um, low quality content. And, and so we believe that a higher emphasis on teaching can actually result in higher quality ads on these platforms. So if platforms served ads based on explicitly provided signals, um, rather than implicitly learned ones, ads might be more relevant. And users, if they have a, cl if they, if they have a clear idea of what they're teaching these agents, um, then they can understand, better understand why they got these ads, making ads more uh, transparent and uh, trustworthy as a result, and improving overall platform experience. And just to, um, I'm out of time, unfortunately, but just to uh, quickly recap here, and the text should be white, so once again, sorry about that. Um, so this is like a, a high-level summary of what's in our paper, but the one thing I'll highlight here is that throughout all of this, we realize that the most exciting opportunities are still yet to come. There's such a rich space ahead of us, and I'd love to you know, continue to talk about questions of where we can go from here. And um, so hopefully that's something that we can do in the panel discussions and also the discussions afterwards. But for now, I'll turn it back to more. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, we'll move on to two papers that uh, kind of look at the design of systems to papers that looked at algorithms and uh, their impact, I would say. Uh, so first up, we have uh, Ben Kaiser. Uh, ben is a PhD candidate uh, in computer science at Princeton at the Center of Information and Technology Policy. Uh, if his research looks at uh, usable security, privacy, and information uh, integrity. Very interesting uh, work to be presented. Looking forward to it. Stop the timer. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Let's find out what these slides look like. Um, so there's been a lot of conversation uh, at this conference uh, the last few days about sort of how limited our, our real world knowledge is about how platform design and algorithms affect society. Uh, you know, and in particular, uh, not only real world evidence, but, but sort of direct causal evidence measured in, in real world settings. Uh, there was something uh, Yoel said at his, uh, on his panel yesterday you know, about how platforms do have some of this evidence, right? They, they've done um, A-B tests, you know, randomly deployed uh, interventions and, and other types of design uh, changes and, and new features and measured how these affect uh, internal platform metrics like exposure and, and engagement. Um, but the people who don't have this information is the public and regulators. So there's, there's kind of an evidence gap here between what platforms know about how uh, their uh, you know, design and algorithms affect um, public interest outcomes and, and what everyone else knows. And so you know, one example of uh, an area where uh, this is, is really having sort of a, a, a deleterious effect on our ability to create evidence-informed policy is around countering the spread of misinformation online. So you know, despite really intense public and regulatory interest in this question for like seven or eight years, we still don't really know uh, whether platforms are amplifying misinformation, whether they can effectively deamplify it, or whether there are other types of countermeasures that um, you know, can effectively reduce engagement with, with misinformation. So the, the state of play on misinformation is that platforms are definitely doing a lot. Um, they, they've deployed dozens of different informative interventions, so uh, things like fact checks, media literacy tips, um, uh, labels, warnings, uh, they've also done uh, quite a bit of content removal, uh, banning accounts, uh, especially around uh, coordinated disinformation campaigns where they do targeted investigations and, 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 and sort of you know, large-scale removal. Uh, and then they're also using uh, reduction uh, interventions, uh, I'll call them deamplification, where they might demote content in ranked feeds or they might exclude it from being um, uh, promoted or uh, sort of uh, even discovered via search or, or other platform discovery mechanisms. So, so this is sort of you know, a high-level taxonomy of what, of what platforms are doing, uh, remove, reduce, and inform. And you know, again, we don't really know if any of these interventions are working in practice. And we also don't know what the comparative effects are and what the trade-offs might be, uh, both in terms of the effects and sort of the normative uh, um, outcomes. So what we'd really like to know is when these different kinds of interventions are deployed on platforms, uh, how do they affect user behavior and engagement with misinformation? I think this is a pretty key question. 
So there are two potential sources of evidence on this question. Uh, one is platforms themselves. You know, as, as I said, they, they, they do run A-B tests. Uh, they do uh, you know, large-scale descriptive studies, You're sort of looking at um, you know, uh, uh, sort of quantitative evidence on, on, on what's happening. Um, but they're really not sharing much of this data, and they're, they're really not sharing it in detail. Uh, we see uh, a lot of sort of cherry-picked data coming out of platforms. You can see an example here. Uh, where Mark Zuckerberg's talking about uh, warnings they deployed for COVID. He cites a 95% effectiveness rate, which anybody, anybody who studies this area knows is, is unlikely. Uh, de depends on the measurement approach, obviously, but you know, there's, there's a lot of context lacking to be able to interpret the data that platforms are putting out. Uh, so what they have put out has really emphasized the informative inter interventions, things like fact checks, warnings, uh, media literacy tips. Um, and they've also talked uh, a bit about their removal interventions, but they really haven't talked about reduction and, and deamplification. Uh, there's really little to no quantitative data uh, about sort of how these interventions are deployed or what the effects are. And so this has led a lot of people to believe that informative interventions are highly effective. Uh, things like warnings, inoculation, fact checks, et cetera. Uh, there was just an article in the New York Times a couple weeks ago pointing out that misinformation engagement on Facebook is down significantly over the last four years. And it, it cites uh, fact checks and, and media literacy trainings as the main cause for that decrease. But there actually isn't evidence from platforms to support uh, that claim. So the other potential source of information is uh, scholars, independent research. And there's been an extensive amount of work, uh, some presented at this conference and, and, and conducted by, by scholars at this conference. Um, this body of research has really extensively studied informative interventions. So uh, we did a literature review for this paper. We found over 270 studies uh, that are looking at the causal effects of informative interventions. And you know, broadly what this body of literature shows is that these interventions do have significant effects on important outcomes. Users ability to discern misinformation, uh, the, the accuracy of their beliefs, uh, their self-reported likelihood of sharing this information if they come across it on social media. And they find sort of effect sizes that are in the small to medium range, like uh, 20 to 40 percent of a standard deviation. Uh, the, the challenge is that without platform collaboration, there are um, sort of major hurdles to moving beyond the methods that are, that are currently in practice. So we see a lot of um, laboratory studies. Uh, you, know, you might show users screenshots of posts and uh, ask them about their beliefs or, you know, their, again, their self-reported behavioral intentions. And you know, these are really important methods. Uh, they, they actually they have benefits over, over field methods in, in a lot of key ways. Um, they can control things a, a lot more than you can in a field setting. Um, they can be more imaginative. They can test things that platforms are not ready to deploy in the field or that aren't even capable of being deployed on platforms as they currently exist. And I think there are also fewer ethical concerns with doing a laboratory study versus you know, randomly deploying interventions to real users. Uh, but there are also some, some negative trade-offs. And, and in particular, they, they might be around external validity. It's hard to know when you study these things in a laboratory, you know, whether those effects actually translate to how users will really behave in the real world when they see these interventions. And um, you know, behavioral outcomes are, are one area where this trade-off really exists. And the other thing is that it's very difficult to study reduction interventions in a laboratory setting if you're sort of not connected to the actual algorithm, you know, the actual feeds uh, you know, that are, that are uh, showing users content in practice. Uh, you, you would have to sort of simulate these things. And, and again, you, you, you come up against some validity concerns here. So uh, our study is um, uh, the, the first real world comparison of the behavioral effects of a few different types of common misintervention, uh, misinformation interventions that platforms uh, are deploying in practice. Um, so uh, we deployed this study in collaboration with DuckDuckGo, which is a privacy technology company that operates uh, a search engine. Um, they have very strong guarantees against user tracking, uh, you know, very strong guarantees on user privacy. We adhere to all of this in our study. Uh, they, they are uh, quite large scale, not, not quite as large as Google, but they do serve about 100 million queries daily, so qualifies as a major platform. And what we did for this study was we uh, designed three interventions to simulate common interventions that other major platforms are using. So uh, one of these was information panels. This is a, uh, a feed level or a page level informative intervention. So rather than being attached to a specific result or piece of content, it appears at the top of a search results page where known misinformation results uh, appeared uh, on, on the results page. So these have fact checks or other types of uh, sort of you know, informative messages that, that are designed to help users resist misinformation or avoid it. 
We also deployed a related art articles module, which is a form of uh, amplifying trusted news to the, the very top of the SERP. So uh, you would get a carousel of, of news stories uh, above all the other results. And then we also tested some downranking interventions. And um, we collected anonymized data about how these interventions affected the types of results that users engaged with. So did it make them more or less likely to click uh, valid news results or misinformation results or other types of results? or to you know, leave search results pages without selecting any results at all. And we also measure engagement with the interventions themselves. So uh, I apologize for the giant table of numbers here, but I tried to highlight the sort of key findings. Um, the, the, the main thing that we found here is that the deamplification interventions, as you might expect, were incredibly effective. The stronger uh, deamplification intervention we tested reduced engagement with misinformation by 50%. So you know, a very large, very significant effect. Uh, we also found that this related news module, which is a form of amplification intervention, was very effective at increasing engagement with news. So it did not decrease the amount of news results that people selected in the organic results, but it added on all the times that they clicked on news results in the, the module itself. So the overall increase here was about 40%. So, so these two interventions were, were very effective and, and showed significant effects. The informative interventions we tested broadly did not show, uh, did not show significant effects on user behavior. So the key takeaways I, I want to highlight here are that, you know, again, these amplification and deamplification interventions are, are very effective, maybe among the most effective ways that are sort of currently in practice to reduce engagement with misinformation and increase uh, engagement with credible sources of news. Uh, our findings are somewhat in contrast with this large body of laboratory research that suggests that these informative interventions are significantly and highly effective. Um, I, I think that to, to some extent, Platform secrecy has really hindered public and regulatory understanding on these issues. They've done things like public statements, transparency reports, data sharing agreements. Um, you know, but again, I, I think a lot of people have sort of you know, misbeliefs about what actually works in, in, this, in these scenarios. Uh, and, and these types of co-design studies between platforms and scholars are potentially a very powerful way to shed light on these issues. Uh, you know, I think that the types of one-off studies like we did here are, are not necessarily scalable. They rely on special relationships with platforms, platform goodwill, lucky timing to some degree. But the, the general approach of, of trying to get uh, researchers to co-design studies with platform, co-design data collection, uh, is actually a very powerful way to investigate these kinds of issues. Uh, and a lot of times platforms will cite privacy concerns as a reason they can't do these types of studies, but in partnering with a very privacy conscious com company, I think we demonstrated that it's actually possible to get around those issues with some sort of careful research design and, and careful data collection. Uh, so thank you to my collaborators, DuckDuckGo, my colleagues at Princeton CITP, and to uh, the Knight Foundation, Arvind and Katie for organizing this great event. Thanks. I'll just add that uh, your findings are not in contrast to recent work from my lab. We haven't published yet, but we show that uh, trust uh, evaluations of search results do not change when you have informational uh, any banners. And Interesting. Uh, great. Our next speaker, uh, Angela Lai, is a PhD candidate at NYU, the Center of uh, Data Science, and a graduate research associate at the NYU Center for Social Media and Politics. Uh, research interests include natural language processing, network analysis, and political and social behavior and its interactions with social media. Should present uh, research work that uh, already grabbed a few headlines. Okay, all right, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, hi everyone, I'm here today presenting joint work with Megan Brown, Jim Bisbee, Richard Bonneau, Jonathan Nagler, and Joshua Tucker from NYU Center for Social Media and Politics on how YouTube recommends content to real people. Um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, there's been a lot of concern over YouTube's potential ability to radicalize users by leading them down rabbit holes toward increasingly extreme content. The thing is, a lot of those stories are based on anecdotal evidence while much of the existing research in this area often leans on automated browsers or observational data like user watch history. So we try to bridge that gap by recruiting real users and controlling for user choice. 
we're interested in the following research questions. We want to look at whether YouTube appears to contribute to echo chambers, rabbit holes, and system-wide ideological bias where we're defining those concepts here using the political ideology of a video. And I'll define those a little more concretely as I get to the results. To, I guess we're, we're starting off facing a couple of major challenges already, right? First off, how do we isolate for the effects of the recommendation algorithm while studying real people? Normally, when you watch a YouTube video, you might search up a result and then choose the next video you want to watch from one of the recommended videos on the side. Here, we assign users to a traversal task where they install a browser extension, so there's no platform collaboration required here, and we give them a random seed video to start off on, and we assign them a rule where we say, click the ice recommendation every time. So they'll click on the ice recommendation then they click on the ith recommendation associated with that video, and they repeat this for a total of 20 steps. We also collect some additional survey information, and we actually use some of this post-election attitudes info for a different study. But so that's how we try to address that challenge. The next challenge we face is estimating the ideology of YouTube videos at a large scale. So I won't go too, into, too much into the details here. Uh, we do have a separate paper on this if you want to read more about the method, just to give a really high level overview. In the same way that others have estimated ideology as a latent variable by looking at how, let's say, legislators vote on bills or how interest groups rate politicians, we look at how subreddits choose videos. And ultimately, we end up with ideology estimates that we can then use to train a natural language processing model on video text metadata, like the video title and description. And we ultimately get a model that can estimate the ideology of any political YouTube video as long as we have its text metadata. And so the key benefit here is that we get a more granular measure that is scalable and fairly cheap to update. We go through a number of validation exercises in the paper, and I just included a couple of them here. So first on the left, I'm showing the mean like ideology scores per channel plotted against categorical channel labels from existing work. And one thing I want to note here is that you can see we get a little bit of a finer grain picture of what these channels might look like. So for example, in this left category, we have one group of more progressive channels, this you know, lump on the left, and then a group of more mainstream channels. Additionally, we show the distribution of video ideology for some relatively well-known popular channels. So now that we have our survey data and our ideology estimates, I'm just showing you here an example of an empirical traversal for one user. We start, as we go along the axis, we're going further down the traversal, and then the ideology is just on the y-axis, where the user is moving from video, is moving along the videos outlined in black. And we start off on a seed video, and then we show the recommendations associated with that video, the ideology of the recommendations, on the next step. So in this case, the user seems to be moving between a pretty diverse set of recommendations. In contrast, here I have someone who, if they're conservative, we might define them as landing in an echo chamber. Where, so here let me define what I mean by echo chambers and rabbit holes. We say that a user lands in an echo chamber if they are only shown content that is ideologically congruent with their beliefs. Rabbit holes, however, are a function of time. Over time, the user might be led toward an echo chamber, toward videos that are ideologically narrow and ideologically extreme. This can be on the left or the right. So in this case, we might say that this is an example of both echo chambers and rabbit holes. However, we naturally need to look at all of our data uh, while these illustrations are instructive, we want to look at this uh, overall. 
So first up, we look at the question of echo chambers. We look at the ideology of recommended videos and compare it with the self-reported ideology of our survey respondents. What I wanna highlight here is that the distributions are very similar. However, we do observe a rightward shift in the mean of the ideologies of the recommended videos as you move from extreme liberal to extreme conservative. However, I will note that while this difference is statistically significant, it is quite small in magnitude. Next up, we look at the question of rabbit holes, where users who are liberal are in blue, uh, moderates in gray, and conservatives in red. And we essentially look at how the distribution of the, I the ideologies of the recommendations they get change as they move further down the traversal. Uh, once again, we don't see much of a shift nor much of a difference between liberals, moderates, or conservatives. We do see, once again, this like slight shift toward the right. Uh, once again, it is small magnitude, but consistent with what we saw on the last slide, right? Oh, um, okay. And finally, we look at system-wide ideological bias, which we define as regardless of your ideology or what videos you're watching, do we find that YouTube tends to push you toward, you know, does YouTube tend to have a certain ideological slant to its recommendations? So we do that here by looking at liberals and conservatives, so just, you know, in red and blue, and if they start off on a liberal seed, a moderate seed, or a conservative seed, what happens to the ideology of their recommendations over time. Sort of consistent with the results that I showed previously, we find that there is a little bit of a shift toward the right, uh, just once again, small magnitude, but it is there. And we also find that there is some narrowing in the variance of the ideologies of the recommended videos that they see. So they are getting a little bit narrower um, and shifting a little more to the right as they click on more videos. So to just to sum up our results, right? So we do find that recommended content varies with user ideology, that there's a little bit of a decrease in ideological variance and some shift to the right as users continue to follow the recommendation algorithm. However, I think there are a couple of significant caveats with this type of work, right? Like, I've presented sort of a methodology or a framework for studying the recommendation algorithm at different periods of time. Of course, YouTube's recommendation algorithm is ever-changing. Importantly, I also have to note here that we're focusing on ideologically extreme content rather than other forms of extremism like uh, violent content. Also, our results don't mean, of course, that YouTube can't be a tool for uh, radicalization or that it's not full of extremist content. That could very well be the case. Um, it just might be that the algorithm is less of a driver in that radicalization than people sharing content and kind of like pushing others and you know, social media communities toward certain videos. But of course, that's hard to say. Um, and that is the end of my talk. Thank you so much to the Knight Foundation, Arvin and Katie for organizing this great symposium. I'm looking forward to the panel discussion. Thank you. Uh, thanks all of you. Uh, we'll have, uh, we have time for discussion, so I'm gonna start with a couple of questions and then uh, we'll open it up for audience and uh, remote. So for audience, for the audience here, there's a mic right there. Uh, and you can also submit the question with the QR code, uh, the audits online, I think there's a Google form uh, they can go to, so uh, feel free to submit the questions. Um, so maybe first, uh, up, uh, maybe a quick, uh, uh, some of the approaches that we've seen in your talks and uh, in the symposium so far, right, we had the informational approaches. We killed those, those don't work. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, they may work, I think we have evidence that they uh, don't have may, many, a lot of impact, may, maybe or maybe not still important to include. Uh, we've seen nudges, right? we've seen uh, user active controls, uh, like the one that uh, Kevin outlined, maybe uh, Yoel yesterday talked about uh, the defaults work, uh, but maybe there's some other ideas. Uh, we've seen platform changes and algorithmic uh, changes uh, that uh, may or may not be needed or evident. Uh, and then there are new platforms, perhaps, that Jason points out, maybe we should create a start from scratch uh, with new platforms and algorithms. So 
maybe for each of you, what would you go first? Like, what's the one thing? <laughs> Don't tell me, ah, all of the above, we need to do all of them. What, what's the one thing you would start uh, to change our information ecosystem today, whether yourselves or going to the platforms or going to regulators? I, I can maybe chime in. Um, of course, I want to say, say both. I want to do everything. But the, the thing I'd like to see most, which was articulated nicely in a recent article by um, Ethan Zuckerman and, and covered in the New York Times, I think, is uh, the future of social media should be smaller and denser, right? I think we often forget that this all-in-one platform like Twitter or Facebook even it is weird. Like, it's weird that I'm having conversations with my coworkers in the same room as my political representatives, it's as the same rooms as my uh, high school friends, right? Um, there should be space for cat memes and mindless scrolling, people, people like that, but I think that space shouldn't be the same space we have discussions about science and important political discussions. So I'd like to see uh, more variety in the platforms we have available to us and we can uh, have sort of more purpose-built communities because that's what we have as human beings in the real world, so to speak, the offline world. Um, and so I'd like to see social media design go in that direction. Yeah, I suppose we could just go down the line here. Um, more, I know you mentioned, uh, you know, don't say all of the above, but I'll just do that in a very indirect way here. <laughs> um, so I, I think, you know, there, at least from, from, you know, my HCI instinct, my instinct here is, you know, towards user empowerment and giving more uh, affordances to the user. Um, and, and you all mentioned yesterday that, you know, defaults are very powerful and I definitely, you know, very, that's very much true. And I think, although that might be just, you know, a, an implication of the designs of platforms in that these defaults are usually hidden away in some menu that no one really accesses. And so something that I've been increasingly interested in and we kind of explore in the paper as well is how do we bring these defaults more, you know, into the user interface in front of users so that they can just, you know, constantly reflect on this every once in a while. And one of the, the things that we talk about in the paper is this idea of, um, instead of you know, the infinite scroll where everything you know, continually loads, what if things are, are still loaded in batches but they're done in a very intentional way with breaks in between so that users can use those breaks to say like revisit some of their settings or to specify how, how the next batch should change from the previous batch going forward. And these interface changes of course tie in a lot with some of the underlying algorithmic changes as well. So if we design these new affordances that are able to capture these new forms of user feedback, then we can perhaps use those forms of feedback um, in the underlying algorithm. On the other hand, you know, if we design new algorithms that we're interested in um, testing out and these might be able to benefit from these new kinds of user interactions, we will you know, then need to modify the user interface. So I think a lot of these, uh, it's not like a question of either or, but they're very much entangled. Um, I mean, I, I agree with the sentiment that design changes and, and sort of centering users uh, is important, but that's not quite what my research examines, so I'll, I'll maybe talk about something that I think follows on from my findings. Um, you know, we see that deamplification and reduction works. Uh, I'm not going to say we should be reducing or deamplifying more, but I do think there are ways to improve the quality of those interventions. Um, you know, one of the hard things is figuring out what to deamplify, right? Especially for uh, smaller platforms don't have the resources to do the level of investigation that, that large platforms might. Uh, platforms need more information about, uh, you know, sources of harmful content, um, uh, you know, not just misinformation, but, but other categories as well. Uh, I, I think it would be good if there was more mandated transparency for these platforms around these issues. I think it would also be good if there was more cover for platforms because they're subject to political attacks from many different directions uh, when they when they intervene uh, algorithmically. So um, you know, sort of thinking about the idea that there's strength in numbers, I, I, I like the idea of um, sort of a clearinghouse of data for um, uh, you know again for, for misinformation for other types of harmful content, you know, labeled data, you know, something like ground truth. Um, this would be data contributed by platforms based on their own internal investigations, potentially contributed by, by other sources as well, um, you know, certainly civil society groups and, and scholars and potentially governments uh, in, in, in some capacities. I think this would help um, level the playing field for small and emerging platforms. 
Um, and uh, I think it would increase the consistency of what people see across the web, uh, which, which would, would also be helpful for ensuring that um, you know, people don't just, um, uh, you know, for, for ensuring that the, the information gathered by one platform isn't just used for their own benefit, but actually benefits users across uh, their, their various experiences. Yeah, I think, uh, okay. I th yeah, I think that's super important. Um, and hopefully this doesn't come across as like a cop-out answer, but I think that one of the most important things is improving digital literacy. Because I think that the incentives for news outlets or uh, websites to pop up and maybe promote misinformation or even just really sensational content is always going to be there in some form. I do think that there's some natural human tendency to be drawn to those things. So we, of course, we need algorithmic, you know, amplification um, studies and regulations. But I think there's always going to be new platforms proliferating with like different pr approaches to that. And I think the, in my mind, the most important thing is just making sure that people learn how to judge content from an early age, just because so many of us live like so much of our lives online, um, which is of course a much like larger scale and institutional change, but I think that's really one of the most like important changes that would need to be made. Um, I think maybe related uh, is the question of uh, um, the achieving scale of, for all these interventions, and in particular, uh, are we, is this a losing uh, proposition uh, uh, to change those systems? Because we have systems that grew to this scale because they were so good at manipulating our uh, engagement, our attention, uh, and they got to it because of our human tendency. So now can we either create uh, systems from scratch that can compete and achieve scale without offering all these uh, benefits, or vice versa, can we now rein in uh, those things and have, hope that they keep uh, people keep using them even though, I don't know, the content is less alarming or more, less engaging? I can maybe speak to the, the issue of designing new platforms and whether they'll, they'll take off, right? I mean, uh, obviously, predicting those sorts of things is, is sort of a fool's errand. Uh, I don't think we can say whether a, a new type of design won't be engaging for users, right? Like, Anecdotally, I think several of us in this room would like to go to a platform and engage if we thought that it's gonna help us form accurate beliefs. And I think whether informative content is actually less engaging is still an open empirical question that hasn't really been dug into enough. Um, and then in, in the space of, of civic technologies where, where people are designing these platforms that are sort of the, the good for you platforms, there are some signs of hope, right? Like people know about Polis, Decidem, and uh, various other examples that get good press and attention, albeit probably not enough attention. Um, so that's not really a, a, an answer, but I think there's reason to be optimistic there. And then I, I always sort of think about the, the parallel to, to our food choices, right? Like I'll pay more for food that tastes worse because it's healthier for me. So why can't we apply the same sort of thinking to our social media platforms and maybe use something that's less intuitively engaging if I know that it's not gonna lead me into a rabbit hole echo chamber or some dark place. Yeah, I, I agree with that optimism. Um, and, and also with Angela's point that there are opportunities for upstream like education that can, that can help here. I, I think there is a growing understanding of the costs of engagement-based ranking and, and also surveillance and personalization and, and sort of these related issues. Um, so uh, you know, I think there, 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 there is actually movement in, in the right direction. Um, but the, the design and the user experience have to be there first, right? These, these like differentiators are only gonna matter if people actually wanna use these platforms, find them easy to use. Um, uh, you know, I think the, the, there was a mention uh, yesterday about you know, Mastodon being sort of a promising platform, but, but user experience challenges, it really inhibiting uh, the, the immediate growth there. So you know, design, as, as Kevin has pointed out, is really uh, pretty, pretty key. Um, I also think there's an opportunity for some regulation to level the playing field here. I think um, you know, we see very strong network effects that keep people locked into the platforms they're on. It's very difficult to leave Facebook, even if you want to, if you get sort of crucial information there because all of your friends are there, your, your networks are there. Um, so I, I think that something like uh, data portability requirements could be a good way to help new platforms get off the ground. 
Yeah, I guess just to chime in here with kind of a broader, higher level a question in response to Moore's question. So whenever there there's this you know desire or goal to scale, um, I always wonder whether it's like why scale is scale really necessary? Um, and you know in in social media platforms where we actually want say more specialized communities and smaller conversations, I think it's you know perfectly fine if if things are at a smaller scale and it's actually a better user experience for, for the scale to be smaller. Um, but on the other hand, if we actually want to leverage, you know, like do more uh, leveraging of like collective intelligence uh, where, you know, the scale actually is meaningful in some way, then perhaps there can be some design choices that are put in from the, uh, you know, from the very beginning, taking scale into consideration, say like, you know, uh, some users might be, you know, have only uh, read only uh, like authority, and some can can you know post content or whatever, um, and that way perhaps there can be you know less of these uh, like undesirable effects of amplification. So thinking about scale and and the the thinking critically about why we need scale, I think that can probably be something that can be incorporated way earlier uh, in conversations about platform design, and that can in turn influence some of these you know, design interventions, as Ben mentioned, that can influence the way these platforms uh, actually are used in the end. We'll take one from the audience. Uh, thank you all. Uh, I found so many of these ideas generative in terms of like, taking a broader view of, of like, what we could optimize for, whether it's truth seeking or uh, more user agency, or uh, also putting all of that on a, a better evidence base. Also, introduce yeah. yourself before you ask your question. <laughs> uh, I'm a software engineer. I work for recommender systems. Um, uh, yeah, I have a question for uh, Kevin on, on, on effort. Uh, I'm, I'm curious. Teaching is something that's very effortful. And, and so I, I expect people to not always be in the mood to teach, maybe only a subset of people to, to want to teach. And, and I'm curious, even if you design the affordances that are really front and center, uh, that allow people to, to state their explicit preferences. Uh, what are we doing about all, all those people who, who will not? About maybe the 90% of people who, like, I guess this is a scale question, uh, who will uh, not, not tell us about their explicit preferences. It, like, it seems very hard to make an argument with mm -hmm. some ML engineer working on, on engagement-based ranking where you get to surveil somebody's milliseconds, they look at each piece of content, why you know, your explicit preferences, uh, which are so sparsely offered, uh, would be a better way of, of aligning a feed with uh, somebody's, somebody's preferences. So yeah, I'm, I'm curious, how are you thinking about effort? Did that come up as you were designing the, uh, this user interface? Yeah, for sure. That is definitely something that we've thought about a lot. Um, and in, in some of the HCI literature, uh, so there's this whole uh, interaction framework that actually informed quite a lot of this work called interactive machine teaching. And a lot of the machine teaching interfaces that were introduced in some of the HCI space, they were very effortful um, in that they, their kind of main objective was to uh, basically get the user to explain these very detailed concepts in these you know, cognitively uh, like loaded user sessions. Um, and so we realized that for teaching to be effective in the feed, we would need to try and lower that uh, in some way. And to some extent, I think we've lowered it a little bit. But yes, I totally agree that uh, effort is still a, a concern when it comes to, you know, given how quickly information is consumed on social media nowadays. Um, I, I will say that in our study, we also found out that you know, user agency is a double-edged sword, right? Like in some scenarios, users want to engage in this more kind of goal-oriented, focused interaction. But in other scenarios, they're, they're, they just want to you know, turn off their brain and just scroll. Um, and you know, mindless scrolling can, can be you know, useful and nice in some scenarios, just you know, not all the time, of course. So I think there's real potential for these kinds of teaching interactions um, to exist in you know these like modes, if you will, like browsing modes, and maybe the the you know non teaching interfaces can also exist in another mode, and users can switch between these modes depending on um, what kinds of uh, browsing interactions that they would want. 
But yeah, I agree that if we were to implement these teaching-based approaches across all social media platforms, that, does, that might not benefit user experience um, because a lot of users are interested in some of these more like relaxed approaches um, and uh, kind of just letting the algorithm handle things, um, but only some of the time. Thank you. Uh, let me take one from uh, the online world. Uh, and it's a question specifically for, uh, about, uh, for Angela, but uh, I'll expand it a little bit maybe. Uh, so the question uh, reads, does YouTube push center-right videos just because there are more of them? People often say that US is a largely center-right country, so if so, lots of center-right videos uh, would be expected. And I guess the general question, uh, I think something uh, uh, both of you touched on, uh, Jason and uh, Ben, uh, how do we think about balancing or ranking content? You alluded to the question of saying, what is misinformation? Uh, you're setting up uh, a, a place where there's you know, right-leaning and left-leaning users, but we know that users and content is multidimensional, have many different sets of preferences. It's not always, obviously, it's not always a dichotomy. It's always a range of where you are on, on each of these dimensions. So, Angela, how, how are you thinking about these first and then others? Yeah, I think it's a little hard to say whether center-right videos make up the majority of like YouTube's political videos just because we don't know the entire universe of YouTube videos, I guess. Um, but I think that's a good point and that could definitely be something, I guess that does sort of lead to Moore's point, right, about then does the platform have a responsibility to try to push you toward like a middle rather than just the uh, majority of the videos. But I think that's definitely something we can try to look into more. Yeah, I don't, I don't have much to add on, on this topic. I mean, the, the right-left uh, one-dimensional thing is a convenient experimental tool for me. I, I mean, I'm, I'm researching in Europe and we still lean on that and we're using uh, American participants, right? Um, the, the what sort a great of, lab we are. <laughs> yeah, it's a living experiment, right? Um, all I will sort of add to this, which is sort of tangential, is that a lot of the content online isn't political at all. So when you try to shove it into some kind of, I don't know, ideology classifier and it spits out some ideology, it's like, is it meaningful if it is just a cat meme? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think when we're doing experiments and researching stuff, we we dive straight into the, this ide ideological battlefield without realizing that most of the content online is not ideological and not political. So it's something I think as a research community we should accept more. Yeah, that, that's an important point that um, political content is a very small sliver of what most people you know, uh, look for and engage with online. So, um, you know, and misinformation is then like a tiny sliver of that tiny sliver. Um, so important not to overinflate. I think the, the importance of these like really tiny um, uh, uh, sort of absolute scale problems, um, but at the same time, to the extent that these problems are concentrated uh, in in certain accounts, certain users, certain settings, like those are the most um, valuable opportunities for for intervention. Uh, so I, I think. Um, uh, yeah, that actually, that's, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really want to get into the, you know, what is misinformation question. That, that could take up the rest of the panel. So I think I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah, you. just to add on, we did look at the watch histories of uh, survey respondents in, like, different contexts. And it did support, Jason, your point that most of the content users are looking at does not fall in the political category at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, what did you find, Kevin, in your uh, study uh, when you had controls? Was there any political controls? If so, if you, you think you need them, uh, and how would you add them? Um, yeah, so using our approach, I, I guess users can configure political controls uh, if they want to, but if that's not something they're interested in doing, then um, they have the option to set controls for other things or just not have any political controls at all. So it's, I think it's, yeah, really up to them. Let's take one from Richard. Thanks. Uh, I'm Dick Reisman, and be, quickly before I get to my question, a comment on Kevin's point. If you think about the systems as bicycles for the mind, why don't we? Why aren't we able to steer them wherever we want, whenever we want? So the mood-related thing is, is kind of a central thing. But okay, so the question is, um, user signals that are implicit seems to me to be the huge opportunity. It's going to be hard to do without the platform's competition cooperation, but 
I've been writing for a long time about reputation-based algorithms that work similar to Google PageRank, where you use human judgment. They use, you know, the edit, the webmaster putting links in as an editorial judgment of which sites were useful. You can do the same things with likes, shares, comments to build reputation, use an eigenvalue-based uh, number to get a reputation. Mm -hmm. And then you can cluster that automatically into communities, subject domains, whatever. Also, if you enable people to build groups and social networks, then you can use their, their natural implicit clustering so that you can build uh, reputations you know, drawn from New York Times readers versus Fox viewers and, and use that as a way to do ranking. So I'm curious whether anybody's, and by the way, Jeff Allen sort of was the only person I've seen who really advocated this hmm. also uh, when he was at Facebook that leaked and he's now at the Integrity Institute. But has anybody seen this? Has anybody, you know, do you think it's useful? Uh, so I think this is closest to you, uh, Jason, maybe you should. Uh -oh. uh, <laughs> first, cool, I would like to know more. Um, Sure. I am not, not familiar, that's a short answer, but I guess the stuff I am familiar with is the general idea of identifying communities and topics through some kind of embedding procedure, right? Um, now, as far as I understand, that is what existing recommender systems are, are tending to do, but uh, I would be totally interested in seeing how, first off, how different is that from, from the stuff you're describing mm -hmm. in the first place? Um, but both seem valid. Yeah, it's not based on count time analysis, yeah. at least not to a significant extent. And, and I think the platforms do it to some degree for, for ad targeting, but they don't do it for, for the user's benefit. Thank yeah, ah, it's a great point. Yeah. Let's keep going. Uh, <coughs> thank you. My name is Wilson. I'm uh, from the private sector. I, I put in a question there, but I want to give it more context. So the question is for, for Jason. Uh, I'm really interested in collective intelligence and there's some research going on at Carnegie Mellon and MIT dealing with that. But I was wondering if you can integrate uh, the ideas of homophilia, uh, social capital, especially bridging social capital, collective intelligence. Are you doing that kind of research? I'm really, really interested in that. And I'll be sending you a lot of emails and wait for that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, uh, it's a great point. And I, I don't want to go into it too much because I know we've got Luke in the audience who's going to be pre presenting stuff in the next section on, uh, on bridging systems, which I think is more directly uh, addressing your question. I will add my two cents to this idea, and it's that bridging systems and, and bridging divides and you know, breaking down echo chambers and finding common ground is, is super important, especially for certain tasks like preference aggregation, where the goal is sort of to, OK, here you've got these people with super diverse and incommensurable preferences, how can you find the option that is uh, the most agreed upon across the group? So, so in that case, like consensus seems like the right objective. But when it comes to things where there is an objective ground truth, like making predictions and even many of the problem solving tasks we have where you're picking what is the best alternative from a set of possibilities, there's a predictive element there. And in those contexts, diversity of opinion and, and letting those sort of echo chambers that might be socially viewed as detrimental, there's a benefit to that. I mean, there's research from the sort of domain of animal behavior that looks at like schooling fish and ants and stuff and they show how um, modular behavior, so letting animals sort of stick it within their cluster, that contributes to a, a global sort of behavior that's beneficial for the entirety of the population even though they're only responding to their local communities. So while it sounds great to break down echo chambers and we should all be in, in one room. There is some benefit to letting people, you know, develop their, their own opinions rather than just homogenizing right away. Thank you for the wonderful talks. I have a question for Angela about how you interpret your effect sizes. Uh, you had a sequence of 20 videos, if I remember right. So I'm thinking about a typical user who might watch, you know, 10 videos per day and over the course of a few years, that's probably going to be a few tens of thousands of videos. So is it plausible that in that context, the effect size is, I don't know, a thousand times what you measured or am I horribly misunderstanding how to interpret this? No, that's a great question. So like, if we 
expanded the time scale, would we see a larger effect size? Is that the thought? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, we didn't observe much of a difference like from around the 10th traversal step onward toward the 20th. Like, I think it started to get kind of static at a certain point. Um, but I am not sure if I can extrapolate that to like, you know, over the course of like years and looking at like different videos and over time, does that like little center right shift eventually accumulate? Um, but at least in the context of our study, we didn't find that this was just, that it was like steadily increasing. It was a little more, um, it was not as linear, I guess. And maybe uh, to follow on, on that, uh, maybe, an, maybe even a more difficult question to answer is, what is the impact on uh, the user, not just in the videos that they watch? What is the impact, how do, we, do they shift, how do we know if they, shifted the ideology, ideology or went uh, to vote more readily or did not uh, go to vote uh, more readily or uh, in other, for all of your studies, right? How do we understand the actual impact uh, on the real world rather than on the online behavior? Yeah, I th I'm not sure if that's something I can answer from our study just because we didn't look at uh, what the users I think because we like assign the users to you know undertake pretty artificial behavior, so they weren't necessarily like actually actively engaging with the videos or anything. So at least for that study, it's I think it's a little hard to say. Yeah, maybe I can just chime in really quickly. I will say that um, like traditional, more quantitative measures, I think this is where things really break down because you know for for impact and and things like satisfaction on a longer time scale. I think we would have to rely on uh, measures that are probably stemming more from human judgment rather than quantitative measures. So things like uh, you know sensation of agency and whether that increased or decreased and how that changed, um, like user satisfaction, very broadly defined, and things like that. So I think the space is you know still very blurry and a lot of there's a lot of kind of like human judgments um, that that should be harvested to evaluate this. Justin. Um, Justin Hendricks from Tech Policy Press. Um, so we could retitle this panel, Empirical Look at User Behavior on Hypercapitalist Platforms, right? Um, how do you isolate the uh, business incentives of the major platforms you study uh, when you think about you know, the effects that you're looking at? We've got now more than a decade of these things being optimized to be money machines. Um, we're not talking about, you know, the internet as a sort of public good here? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is a, a huge problem. Uh, we could just burn it all down, I guess. Um, I mean, it, it's tough, Headline right? for the panel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there needs to be new business models, uh, is the short answer. I, I mean, there, there is sort of a cynical take, which is that uh, engagement and making things like intuitively desirable or enjoyable for the user immediately is the only way to to have a business but I mean like I said like I said with the food analogy right like we appreciate fair trade coffee uh, I will pay more for a healthy kind of crappy tasting granola bar instead of the sh sugary Twinkie <laughs> because I know it's better for me so I think there needs to be sort of a a reckoning with the, the business models that we have now. I don't have the, the answer for where we go next, uh, but this is sort of a, a point that I am not directly conveying through the, the, the work I'm doing now, but I'm hoping to sort of hint at, right? Like, we don't have to just make tweaks to the UI on Twitter and Facebook for, for ad revenue uh, if it suits them. We don't have to just do field experiments looking at things that they're doing to know which one of those things they're willing to do is the best. We can burn it all down. I suppose, yeah, just to offer another idea here. I've been actually um, finding a little bit of hope in franchises, like the franchise model of business, uh, which holds actually many parallels with the organizational structure of uh, Fediverse platforms such as Mastodon in that there is kind of this one central operational framework, but then it's broken up into these kind of separate branches uh, where you have 
you know, local um, instances or like local stores in the case of franchises that cater to kind of local needs. And franchises have been shown to be flourishing under capitalistic models, uh, you know, capitalistic economies, sorry. Um, and, and so to some extent, I, I suppose this is one potential direction that we can look towards going forward. Yeah, I think one counterpoint I might make is I aspire to be more helpful in my food choices, but I find that that doesn't always win out. And I think that there are many other people who might choose the tastier option over healthier options, even though that might not be what's best for them. Um, so that's kind of like a difficult preference to deal with. And I don't know if other people had different experiences, but I think, um, I do feel like Mastodon is like a really great example and s sort of interesting because I feel like it hasn't taken off, um, but I really welcome any challenges. And I think that another thing that I just wanna highlight is the hyper-capitalistic you know, platforms, that's not great. But one problem is that moderating these platforms and you know the, the teams of lawyers that they need to have and like running all those moderation things costs a lot of money. Like it is not cheap to, um, as we might see with Twitter becoming increasingly like hands off the steering wheel and stuff, it can be less expensive to just sort of um, let things go. And I guess like it just takes so much many resources to police the platform properly that I feel like then you would need to introduce alternatives like perhaps government funding or some other way to um, you know, provide those resources for like smaller platforms. Otherwise they might be, you know, they, they might need money and they just can't compete. I think following up maybe on a good for you theme, uh, uh, Daphne asked yesterday about uh, essentially a question about system one and system two engagement, right? So system one, the, the quick, uh, reflective, reflexive, uh, uh, not very deliberative uh, uh, approach to making decisions and system two where we engage, deliberate perhaps, uh, stop and think. Uh, we essentially have system one systems out there, right? Can, and I think you're making the argument in some cases, we need to need or could move to system two systems. Is that is that something that is that the argument you're making, and is that possible? Yeah, I guess kind of. Um, so one thing that I think relates to this is, you know, just these discussions about um, the perils of just optimizing for engagement and how that uh, extends our time on these platforms and how that's, uh, you know, harmful in many ways and. I think regarding time spent on these platforms, there's a couple ways to think about it. One is that the time spent is unproductive, and then the other is that the time spent is actually productive. And I think that can you know, tie into system one, system two a little bit in that um, a lot of the time, I think most of the discourse around uh, social media usage time has been focused more on kind of the more unproductive pieces of it, in that you're kind of just shutting off your mind um, and consuming, and then when you leave the platform, you don't really take away anything that's, uh, that will help you in your life outside of the platform. But if these affordances can prompt, um, I guess like more system two levels of thinking, and can start to turn these platforms into say like, you know, tools for learning, um, and you know, tools for you know, appreciating you know, other people's talents, et cetera, um, I think that can really change the way um, time is spent on these platforms and, and perhaps transition things into uh, kind of like being more productive and being more meaningful. Um, and that way, like time on these platforms will actually be, you know, something can potentially be something positive instead of just being in a negative light all the time. I just, I have a quick comment and question, um, mostly thinking about sort of temporalities of implementation of these questions, of these sort of phasing changes that could occur on platforms and um, sort of considering also specifically like when we take sort of maybe more, so if we take a step back from maybe platforms and we think about other forms of infrastructure implementation, like if you think of like biking in the Netherlands or something, it took 30 years for them to that, for that to become sort of the norm in the country for travel as a beneficial way of getting around, but also because initially it was about reducing traffic accidents with children. Mm -hmm. And so this question of like, how do we identify risk and then think about sort of slowly using public and private incentivizing to then get to a point where maybe the beneficial side effect is that now it's sort of accepted as a wide 
like a, a modality that everybody uses, but in fact, that was not necessarily the case when it started. And so my question to you, and I think a question that's sort of come up throughout the, the different panels of the conference is thinking about like, what are the phasings of implementation? Like what are temporalities that we could think of for these design changes that also could, you know, allow folks to think about adapting to a new norm of use on platforms because we know that there are risks. And I think all there's been plenty of evidence now that is stating that those risks can be shown and we're seeing these sort of siloed effects and all these other things. So like, you know, what is the phasing that we could be imagining and, and how can we be encouraging that across platforms, I think, on this systems two shift that you're also noting? Uh, <laughs> Jason. <laughs> Take it away. Um, I mean, I think this is this is verging out of my my realm of, of, of knowledge here. I think this is where regulation has to come in, right? And I am extremely nervous to talk about regulation at a Knight Foundation event <laughs> as someone who's never studied law. Um, so I'm, I'm going to stop there. <laughs> um, I guess, like, maybe this is an answer that you know threads onto the example of biking in the Netherlands because I, I was actually listening to a podcast recently about this, so this is kind of fresh in my head. But one of the, the main uh, reasons for success of widespread adoption of you know, bicycles as a method of transportation in the Netherlands is uh, these very passionate groups of um, you know, like anti-car groups and like pro-biking groups that um, basically, you know, came together and said, you know, we're going to do this, we're going to change the way things are. So one potential direction forward might be to um, empower uh, user groups and regulatory groups and different groups of stakeholders to come together and, and have more of these kinds of conversations um, and to, to kind of think about and test out and evaluate and ideate on these new kinds of um, design affordances and, and design principles. We have time for two quick uh, last questions. Uh, let me ask one uh, quick answers uh, so we can squeeze another. Is uh, are we worried about all uh, people or some people, some groups of people? There's a question online. It's uh, if we see uh, different behaviors from different uh, age cohorts. Uh, are you more optimistic about maybe the younger crowds? I think kind of just to hammer home the earlier point I made. I think. Um, wait. I think I would be most concerned about people with worse digital literacy. Mm -hmm. So maybe an older generation or people who can't really distinguish, you know, misleading TikToks or misinformation from factual, reliable news. Yeah, focusing on misinformation, I mean, there, there is evidence that older adults are more susceptible to it. Um, but, but I also think there's evidence um, from David Rand's group showing that uh, elite uh, members of society are really driving a lot of the spread of misinformation on, on platforms. So I think there, there's more than just an age breakdown or sort of demographic breakdowns that we can look at. There's, there's political uh, incentives uh, for, for groups to you know, engage with these systems differently. And it would be nice to uh, try to examine those. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think um, we would be in deep trouble if kind of all users were the problem. And it would be great to you know, focus on, on kind of these specific avenues uh, with which we can improve these systems. Uh, sorry, not much to add, just on the production side, right? Mm -hmm. uh, on uh, of misinformation and stuff like this, it, it's been found that it, it's super spreaders, right? A bit like with, with COVID. And so I think uh, efforts to slow production should target those super spreaders rather than something that hurts everyone. Mm -hmm. And final one, maybe a short question, short answers. Uh, uh, Virginia Dignam, I just have to react on the bikes in the Netherlands. I'm Dutch. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and there are no anti-car groups in the Netherlands or whatever other kind of uh, uh, things like that. Oh, the really? success of uh, the bicycles in the Netherlands, and I think we can learn from that. One is education and culture. We have been biking in the Netherlands since uh, the 20s, and that's the kind of thing to go. And another one as important is the existence of infrastructure which makes it possible to bike safely around. And that I think it goes uh, very much in line with what you are saying.
are saying about the alternatives and the fair trade and things like that. The infrastructure makes it possible, and because the infrastructure is there, then we all bike. But there are no cars, uh, anti-car groups or whatever things like that that make it possible or uh, strong uh, strong opinions on bikes in the Netherlands. Okay. Oh, you. interesting. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll revisit the podcast and see. But yeah, thank you for the point about um, thank you for the point about infrastructure. I think that's definitely very relevant. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, thank our panel.